Hi everyone, I'm Sebastian Reynolds. Welcome to my podcast. This is show number two with the photographer and filmmaker Oliver Holmes. Oliver's an old friend of mine. We sort of collaborated in different ways. He's done portraits for me and yeah, he's he's a great guy and we've actually done a lot of meditation together as well. We both practice this form called Samatha meditation and we've been on retreats together in Wales. Um, yeah, we range over a few different topics. The sort of genesis of this was we've both been thinking about starting podcasts for a while and I was interested. It's a bit sort of... Um, Maybe I'm being a bit clever, clever, but the the idea of sort of doing a podcast about podcasting, but not in not in too much of a nerdy kind of do's and don'ts, much more sort of abstract and philosophical and th- thinking about the digital age and the performative nature of discourse and sharing of information from the two kind of extremes of methods of discussion that we have now of Twitter and the short form kind of method that really seems to in some ways possibly encourage or at least legitimize a certain kind of tribalistic and aggressive approach and then podcast culture which hopefully is the sort of opposite in some senses in that it's about long form conversation and discussion often between people that actually disagree on topics and so, but still there's this interesting question about making intellectual discourse a performance in a way. I mean, it, it always has been. And there's been this sort of was something we touch on in the podcast is going back to the sort of thinking about it as a sort of town square in a way, speaker's corner. But anyway, I, re- I really hope you enjoy the uh, discussion that we had and Oliver's links are in the comments well not in the comments but in the information box underneath this on YouTube so yeah check it out and I hope you enjoy it thanks so much yeah hello Oliver nice to see you nice to be here and um, so we've both uh, been thinking a lot about podcasting and thinking about starting our own ventures and I was actually just thinking before we started this conversation how um sort of differences in our backgrounds and our approach to this in the sense that someone pointed out recently it's quite interesting that the idea that of sort of the performative nature of discourse um in a in any sort of public space so whether it's twitter and and that sort of side of social media or the other side the other side of the coin in terms of this sort of long form discursive format they're like the opposites right but there's still sort of a common thread in the sense that you know this is a different experience knowing that you know we're not doing it live stream but there's that awareness that there are going to be people sort of engaging with it and it is an act of sharing and it does have a sort of performative element as well and I was thinking from my side obviously I am a performative artist like I play music and I have done for a very long time for most of my life and I've done as well as sort of composing music to perform I've also been very like I have a lot of grounding in improvised music so sort of making stuff up on the spot Um, and I'm interested from your perspective as a photographer, as someone in terms of your discipline. And so you're, you're sort of very much, you know, you develop your practice is all about that being behind the lens literally and like out of public sight in a way. So I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about your, like what's motivated you to take this sort of step because for me as a performance artist like a musician that performs it's sort of there's a logical progression to it in a way but maybe for you it's a slightly different movement would you know what I mean I do yeah um I think an element of it so obviously like you said both both in terms of the short form and the long form there's the sort of performative element and the element that you want to 
you need to structure your thoughts in such a way that it's perhaps less fast and loose than it would be in just a conversation between two people. Um, and it's more sculpted, particularly in the short form, because you're having to whittle away everything that's kind of extraneous. Whereas at least if we're having a conversation, you know, there's more room for a sort of circuitous route to the to the final answer. Um, from the point of view of photography, I think it's interesting because I suppose it's a bit like the difference between musicians playing live and recording in that obviously I shoot in a live environment, but fundamentally... I know that when, like if you're on stage, the audience hears every single note you play. Whereas as a photographer, I expect to maybe, so frequently in a shoot, I might shoot maybe 2000 images. And I know that at the most, I'm probably going to show between 25 and 50 of those images. So I'm used to making and generating a lot more work then I know I will finally show. So it's interesting for me in this kind of realm because, I mean, obviously I, you might be doing some editing, you might cut some of the dull bits, you'll cut some of the many ums and ers, but at the same time, it's a bit more like everything said essentially goes in. Whereas as a photographer or even as a filmmaker, there's still a sort of like, I don't know, 20 to 1 ratio between the work that gets created and the work that finally gets shown to the public. So it does feel a bit more exposed. Um, and even with writing, writing feels exposed because, you know, I've just started this newsletter and it, it feels more exposed because I was writing in a sort of more emotionally open way and talking about my practice and it's been a difficult year for various reasons. Um, but even that was, you know, it was still drafted and then edited over successive, you know, edits there were lots of revisions made it was sharpened up i removed things that weren't exactly what i was intending to say whereas that's less of the case with this you know what the first things that come out my mouth are the things that i end up telling you you know um I, yeah go on. yeah and i um and i suppose that's something that i'm sort of fascinated by is this you know and as you say it's such a big part of your work is that um selection process and refinement process of going through the shots and working out how many what tiny fraction of the overall content that you've generated is actually worth sharing and what you want to to bring across and i suppose it's it's just a, a sort of difference and this it's it's a strange sort of almost irony with with podcast culture and and it goes back as obviously you know, there's been this tradition of public presentation of discourse between thinkers for a long, long time, you know, going back to at least to the, the Greeks and Romans and so on. It's it's in some ways it's harking back to something that's um, connecting us to the roots of something that's very, very ancient. Um, and it's something we've heard people pointed out is this idea that for a lot of people, they're much more literate when it comes to spoken word than when it comes to written word in that people can understand much more complicated ideas uh, and concepts if they're hearing it discussed rather than reading it off the page. So it's kind of democratizing as well in the sense. That, um, but no, I was going to, I was going to come back to the point of, yeah, this thing about process and how much, there's a kind of bravery in a way, a sort of in, in being that naked and being that honest about embracing a format which celebrates rather than, you know, the, the, <laughs> the strange irony that like the finished product is the process in the sense that you're like, it's about us thinking and stopping and starting and um and ahhing and like, and, and I wanted to say this in my last podcast as well, that for me, it's, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm here to sort of sell ideas and try and convince people that they should think them. I'm here to like raise questions and I'm really excited to hear people's responses and especially people who have much more knowledge than me. Like I'm, I'm doing this to learn, not to teach. Do you know what I mean? I mean, do you have a, a similar sort of feeling with that? I do. So, yeah, so to, to handle both things, um, to the latter point, I think, yeah, I'm very interested. And I just love learning stuff. I'm always interested in learning things. And I enjoy, 
I think sort of my, my only superpower is a willingness to sort of be very bad at things for a long period of time, which allows me to make an improvement on, be it like learning the piano or learning Italian or all these things, which, you know, it's unlikely I'll ever get that good at them. But I'm sort of interested in that formative stage of the process. And I think I do often go to conversation and I certainly go to podcasts to learn. Um, but also there's an element of sort of sharing. I found I was always good at creating work, but bad at sharing work. And that's changed recently because it feels like, I can't remember where it came from. It might've been Seth Godin, but it was the idea of framing all of your sharing, be it sort of social media or blog posts or whatever you're doing and, and sharing, framing it in a sense of coming from a place of generosity. So it's, you're sharing because you feel like you've got something to contribute and something to help, or maybe something to sort of not really educate is the wrong way of putting it, but just more like putting things out into the world that might be useful for other people and that you might, things that seem pedestrian to you because they're so close are sort of novel and interesting to other people. And that really changed my whole relationship to it because rather than feeling like a chore I had to do for promotional purposes that always felt a bit sort of slimy and uncomfortable for me, thinking of it as, oh, I found this thing really interesting. How can I put this out in such a way that it's going to intivate, sorry, interest and captivate other people um, in the same way it sort of captivated me? Um, and sort of tying that back so the first thing you were talking about is, because I think you were talking, so one thing I think is interesting is on the one hand, I think podcasts can feel sort of very intimate, which is, and, and kind of naked and vulnerable, which is interesting. And I think that's why I really enjoy them. But at the same time, I think you're slightly safer in, in a certain way. I think, I feel like a lot of people who get in trouble in the public eye frequently it's because of a tweet or it's because of a line that's been taken out of context for an interview or an article and actually lacking the lacking context it's easy for other people to impose their reading on it based on their political ideology or their feelings about things or their, their sort of moral positions whereas i felt there are people who not necessarily controversial people but people who frequently evoke strong reactions who by listening to their podcast and having heard so much time of them talking um i feel like i'm much more forgiving of them because while there'll be individual things that i disagree with and can find frustrating i sort of understand that that stands within the sort of grand scheme of their thinking and it's not even that i think oh they that just slipped out i i'm you know i'm happy that they believe that sort of segment of opinion but i know that it's not as radical or difficult or immoral or amoral as it sounds when it's pulled from context because i understand the kind of the the setting that it's it's put within and that it's come out of the environment it's come from you know the sort of environment of ideas that they have you know yeah and 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 certainly like in understanding any co concept or attitude is so much about context and and intention intention behind a view um which can so easily be lost or sort of easily misconstrued and and it's 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 a disapp well, not a disappointment but you have to be honest about how many kind of bad actors there are and people with various agendas and why they might take a dislike to someone a particular individual and kind of want want to come after them and want to willfully misrepresent what they're saying or what they're thinking and and so on but um yeah, I, th I think I'm just fascinated by this, this idea of like a, a sort of collective process and the idea of of thinking, thinking through a position or an idea or a range of ideas. You know, I've got a whole list of of different people that I want to to bring in and, and talk to, and like I've said, and I've heard other people say it as well that you know, having this, this excuse, a platform and, and, a, and a, a reason to just to get to speak to people and understand their perspectives. And, and, and I think it's really important in, in the modern world to be very clear on what you're an expert in and what your sort of expertise are professionally. And then what is just your like <laughs> opinions like no matter how passionately you adhere to them like that they are sort of opinions and and something I'm I'm really I talked about before and I want to keep 
keep exploring is is ultimately one's own sort of biases and and trying to challenge my own biases and see an argument that that's directly counter to my what what I would naturally want to believe to be true and I because I think that's you know that's it's just again it's a strange sort of um dichotomy at the moment where on the one hand you see sort of you know the 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 events in the US and and the storming of the Capitol building and and all the and all, all the like really toxic horrible kind of culture on online of trolling and and deplatforming and just all the all the nastiness all the hatred and cruelty and stuff which just is part of human nature and, and comes out wherever it is and there's like there's that side and then there's a completely opposite side to it as well of like you know people having long form conversations on topics that they disagree on and and but being honest and i think it takes the greatest kind of courage to to humble yourself to something like you're saying whether it's to have a discipline or a practice that that you that you're doing almost just because of the fact that you're not very good at it and that you you need to humble yourself to it or or to sort of ideas to think okay these are my sort of fundamentally held beliefs what can i do to challenge them and undermine them like and and what what's the opposite of being like right well i'm in this tribe because you know me and you are both interested in buddhism and have practiced meditation together for many years and you know this whole idea of like self and 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 self identity and you hear a lot of this chat in buddhism about the whole idea of no self and being egoless and so on it's like what does that actually look like in reality and for me i think one of the things is there's this interesting duality between having a sort of because you you know to function well in the world like whatever religion no religion whatever you are you need to have like a moral framework like there needs to be a basis of like your your ethics how you behave how you treat to other people how you treat other people and how you sort of restrain your worst tendencies like there needs to be a framework but then on the other hand you know this idea of buddhism and no self and the idea that you're constantly questioning as well and trying to learn and grow excuse me and, and thinking about what your where you might be wrong in your moral compass or you might be oversimplifying something or you know and you're not you know this thing about identity and labels like i believe this so i'm part of this tribe or i happen to do this or i happen to eat this way or whatever it might be and then you're part of a club and it's like well that's not a very sort of like having a like what's the balance between having that sort of fluidity and aspiration to learn and grow but then also having a sort of a stable framework as well that's something i'm quite interested in i don't know what you think about yeah absolutely that. i mean both from a buddhist context and yeah from sort of a i don't know growth and flourishing context i think it's paul graham it could be paul graham it could be Derek sivers but someone talked about how it's important to keep your identity small and the more identities you acquire the more difficult it is to shrug them off and make sort of positive change in your life because every sort of identity you acquire is like an extra carapace. It's like an extra layer of armor and rigidity that then puts you into a smaller and smaller box that you then have to to work from when you're working out where you want to go next. Um, so for example, I mean, we've been meditating together for a long time. I still don't self-describe or or even self-identify myself as a Buddhist because I don't really think it's helpful. I'm someone who has found a lot of benefits from the practices and I continue to do the practices. One area, I mean, it's funny, some people say it's better to just talk about what you do, but I still find it more because I think it seems linguistically strange to say, if someone asks me what I do, I still say, oh, I'm a photographer. And often, like, I'm a photographer and filmmaker. But even that's something I try and escape and maybe it's easier to say, oh, I take pictures and I make films because there's a difference there in, in the same way, sort of within the Buddhist framework where there's a lot of power to be, well, there's, there's control to be had where instead of saying I am angry, it's more like there is anger. So it's like an acknowledgement of the conditions that you're finding yourself in a bit like the weather, it is raining, but it's not that you're not identified with it in the same way, which makes it easier 
to distance yourself from it and and you still experience it but you're not completely sort of over oh what would you say overhauled by it so you still maintain a distance so you can you can watch it come through you can let it go away without sort of attaching to it because as soon as it's like yours you almost there's a temptation to re-perpetuate it you know to be the person who's you know your anxiety or your depression you want to get rid of it because it makes you unhappy but at the same time it becomes a bit part of your identity identity like being oh i'm an introvert or you know i love cooking or i'm a footballer or i'm a runner there's all these things that well i'm a vegetarian or i'm a vegan you know and all of those practices might be helpful in your life but i think actually becoming part of the category just constrains you there's particularly you know social pressure is very real and it's very important um and sometimes social pressure can lead to sort of positive behavior change but at the same time in order to fit in and to maintain part of the identity that is important to you you often have to subscribe to more ideas than the original idea you signed on to to become part of the club because there's a sort of broader set of ideals a bit like you know less a little bit in the uk but certainly in america it's interesting that if you know someone's position on gun control you can guess their position on abortion and taxes and the environment and whether masks prevent the spread of coronavirus because none of those they're not related to each other they're comp- you know there's science there's sort of ethical questions there's uh practical questions there's also just sort of yeah it's interesting that those things all seem to go together yet there's no reason why they should all be tied together you know um so it's that thing of yeah the more tribes you subscribe to the more your beliefs are sort of slightly steered into alignment with those tribes that you're part of you know and that's something you know if you want to grow you want to have freedom to move in directions that you see think are more profitable so yeah the less the smaller your identity can be the more room you have to grow into a new space um y- yeah um i i would agree i i would i've got i've just made a note of three different points i want to respond on to that there's there's a lot in there actually a lot to unpick so thank you um firstly i mean i suppose we're sort of in a way drifting into an interesting chat where we'd probably need a third person in the digital space of a, a psychologist or someone who sort of understands the scientific literature on sort of character types and how you sort of and that this conundrum about the the sort of nature versus nurture and 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 on the one hand from a sort of objective scientific perspective you have some a wide range of different topics um that actually underlying they're so massive and so complicated that it's it takes a lot of effort intellectually and spiritually to really engage with how complicated and conflicted any given topic might be but then like most people aren't career professionals in climate or whatever it might be so you're mostly guided by your your like I've I use the term bias your biases but there's also like the, the the idea of the character type right and the the ocean openness conscientiousness extroversion agreeableness and neurosis and and you know there's debates around how how effective categorizing people in those terms really is and there's debates in the scientific community about it i'm not going to say it's like empirically good or bad but certainly it's had a lot of investment in terms of developing it as a a way of modeling people and as far as i understand it again fact check me and correct me if i'm wrong but there's still uh, assessment processes for people going into the most important and like demanding roles like people going into combat stuff and so on or first responders and, and, and you know all those kinds of like life or death type roles where they assess you and it's partly based on that on that scale on and trying to like work out your your adaptability and your suitability for those kinds of environments and and for lots of other high high power jobs as well so there's at least some weight to the idea that people are 
at least partially almost fixed in a way in terms of their their character right that there is a genetic component and then there's a question mark like how much how much is there sort of a nature nurture divide with people or like continuum of people so like in in one way what what is the limit to which you can grow and change as an individual during your lifetime um and and that and so then there's there's no it's no surprise that you have and then with like media clickbait media and and the way that things have gone on a the bad end of the scale in terms of trying to engage with these huge topics that are incredibly complicated you know they boil down to like these sort of <laughs> inflammatory hysterical sort of bullet points in a like hundred word article that's just trying to scare you because <laughs> of the way that algorithms are set up right to get people react more online if they're afraid or angry <laughs> so like the whole culture in one way isn't around long form discussion thought etc but then on the other hand it is because you've got like podcast culture and you've got experts spending hours debating with people they disagree with so you've got the opportunity to hear but again that takes effort but it you know it, it in a one way it's no surprise that you'll have subsets of people where they like they just don't care like they're just like yeah i'm a republican tick 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 those are my views like of course that stereotype exists but i was gonna say like sorry two more points in response to that so i think f for a lot of people one of the biggest issues is a sort of fundamental lack of meaning in their lives. Like we're artists, right? We have vocations, we have passions, we have things that drive us and motivate us. Like there's a lot of science on how, how valuable having these kinds of things are, no matter how trivial they might appear from the outside. And then the problem is that if people don't have a vocation like that, that, that really brings that sort of meaning to their lives and gives them the reason to get up in the morning, what are you left with? And then you get drawn into like these sort of tribalized cults that are based around sort of ideas or whatever it might be, but that people attach themselves to because it, it gives them an identity, it gives them a meaning and a purpose, it gives them a community that they don't have otherwise. And then I think lastly that my, I would say that in terms of as an individual how you engage with a movement or an idea or whatever it might be is how does being involved or, or following that practice or whatever affect you personally as an individual and that we can be so swayed and always have been always will be there's always going to be like the charismatic leaders right the people that are really good uh, tapping in, into people's insecurities and then manipulating them through that right and, and bringing them into a particular sort of cult or, or, or way of being or practice or whatever so I think yeah th those are, that's my must be sort of riffing in response to what you've said I don't know if you have anything you want to to say back to that uh, <laughs> I don't know there, I mean sorry so, yeah yeah no it's fine I just think yeah there's a few things I, so in terms of, I think definitely it's an absence for meaning of meaning and also just the need for safety and security and also just pragmatism that, yeah, you can't be an expert in all of these domains simultaneously. Like fundamentally you have to devolve the, not even decisions, but just sort of like you have to devolve to someone else to do the thinking about a lot of different topics for you because you just don't have time or the expertise to study each one to sort of go through all the different layers of complexity. Um, and also, I think there is a safety in feeling like you belong to something. It simplifies things. Like the world's a sort of, I mean, I guess the, at its fundamental level, like the reason it's so important to find meaning is because the world is fundamentally meaningless. Like there's nothing intrinsic to it that gives meaning it's more to do with or i'm more on the side of a sort of victor, victor frankl style approach which is you create the meaning in it and so from from an art that could be your artistic practice it could be bringing up your children it could be just paying very close attention to your moment by moment experience 
uh, it could come through like a more of a religious feeling of feeling there's something like a connection to something greater than you. Um, but I think that's kind of, that's a human project rather than a, a natural project. It's not, it's not a project. It's not a, the meaning's not imposed on you from outside. The meaning's something you've got to, and I don't even think you have to find it. I don't think it's exterior to you. I think that you have to create it, uh, from within. And that, that takes a while and there's often lots of different iterations and that meaning you'll find it in different places and the meaning itself will change over the course of your life. Um, I do think it's interesting. So for example, I'm someone who thinks that a lot of things are determined. So less so, I mean, the recent stuff I've read, I think it's Richard Plowman who wrote Blueprint, but it seems to be that people talk about it's always nature and nurture. So it's never either or. That's just like a sort of newspaper headline. And it's maybe sort of 50-50. But the difference is that, so genes account for 50% of the sort of the natural settings. But then what's interesting is I think more and more they're finding that the nurture side of it, or rather the sort of the environmental factors aren't what's traditionally been thought of as environmental factory factors like how your parents were and what they said to you and, you know, whether they reinforced you when you did good things. And it's much more to do with the sort of individual chaotic micro experiences that you have over the course of your life. So unless parents are sort of actively abusive or neglectful, and I have like a very traumatic impact, a very wide range of different approaches to parenting, much stricter, much more lenient, seems to do very little um, to shape the character of the person. It's much more likely to be the friends they're around with, which are based on who they ended up sitting next to in their first class of their first week at school. And, you know, they happen to open that magazine in the doctor's surgery and they read an article about something that would go on to become their lifelong passion. So it's that thing that, for example, you know, the th all the, the twin studies and various other things where sort of what's interesting is identical twins reared apart and identical twins reared in the same household are actually, they have the same amount of similarity to each other. So it's interesting in both ways. So, so the interesting thing is, why aren't they completely identical, right? They, they share the same genes and particularly once grown up in the same household, they share essentially the same upbringing. Because there are arguments, some people say that, oh, two children grew up in the same um, household, but perhaps, you know, because of birth order or gender or personality, they were treated differently by the parents, which accounts for difference. But with identical twins, the, the sort of genetic and sort of maybe dispositional characteristics are removed a little bit because they're going to be much more disp dispositionally similar. Um, but then they still find that those twins who grew up together, they're still quite different. But then what's interesting is that the ones who grew up in alternate, like, um, separated by an ocean or in very different families from different social classes or different educational backgrounds, they're still strikingly, strikingly similar, despite having been separated for a lifetime. So it's interesting. There's that thing that it seems that, I mean, in a way, it's kind of a relief. Like as a parent, you're, you're a little bit let off the hook, right? It's very easy for people to get very neurotic and, you know, you've got a precious, like a precious child that there's this kind of guilt culture, I think particularly for, for women, where not only are you supposed to be having this baller job and being super incredible in your career, but also you have to be this absolutely perfect parent who's shuttling your child between extracurricular activities. And, you know, if you lose your temper once because you're stressed out from work and you yell at them, that potentially you're traumatizing them for life. And it would seem to be that that's not really the case. So I think it's good to, I mean, this is a very long waffly answer, but I think it's interesting that you want to separate perhaps. So there's, traits which perhaps are a little bit steered and deterministic like you don't have much room to change them from beliefs which is something that you acquire as you go through life and so that's the thing with the identity i think it's interesting to separate you know there's identity in the buddhist sense which is more like i guess they're talking more about your personality and your more innate things that you can are also a construct and you can sort of let go of versus identity in the sense of tribes you affiliate with or um yeah series of ideas that you're sympathetic to i just read an interesting thing i'll have to send it to you it's called um crony beliefs and it's by i can't remember the guy's name but the blog is called melting asphalt 
Um, and it's the idea that most beliefs are held because, well, you have two different types of beliefs. There's a set of beliefs that are there because truth finding is really important for humans, right? Like from its earliest stage, like you need to know where the food is. You need to know where the tiger was last seen. You need to know where you can find water. So if you think you know where the watering hole is and you've got it wrong, that could have really serious consequences for your longevity. Similarly, if you think you know something about you you checked the road and you didn't see a car and you step out into the road and you were inaccurate in your belief that there wasn't a car there that could end very badly for you but the other side are beliefs that are crony beliefs where you hold them not because the exercise is truth finding but because holding the beliefs themselves is useful or powerful so it could be a belief that makes you feel better about some mistakes you made or it could be a belief that signals that you're part of a tribe that you want to be part of or it's like a belief that's going to make your parents feel proud of you that means you can be integrated into this loving family that you're so desperate not to be apart from um, and I thought that was a really interesting discussion about how you need to work out what beliefs you're holding because you've pressure tested them and you've thought them through and they're things that you're holding because you're trying to get a handle on the truth and if you then find out they're incorrect you're just going to dispense with them and you're going to change to a more accurate belief for the moment until you turn that over again but what's interesting with the crony beliefs is often a good sign that you might have a crony belief is it's one that whenever evidence comes up to contradict it you feel a kind of tightness or a um like you talk about craving right it's like a you don't want to let it go and potentially that's because you're scared of the consequences of letting it go because it's not doing it's not giving you a truth finding use it's giving you a belonging it that its function is belonging its function isn't sort of truth finding so yeah i thought that was really interesting i'll send it over to you i read it this morning so yeah thank you that was really there's a lot of stuff in what you just said that is i'd actually heard also from other sources so like the the twin studies and the idea of raising two twins in separate environments and seeing how they still grow up it was almost the same level of similarity and so on in their character and, and behaviors and so on um i suppose there were two points that sort of came to mind while you were talking there's a lot of sort of in the Sam Harris school and in and, and and a lot of that sort of area, there's a lot of discourse about the idea of free will versus not free will. Um, and I, I, my personal view on it overall in terms of my own experiences and just what, what I've seen just in my life and I can't really refer to any specific scientifically evidenced sort of studies or whatever but just as my, my feeling is that the idea of free will is it's almost like a spectrum that it's not a hard binary and that some people have more or less agency in their actions and i i certainly feel like in in just purely in terms of experience in my life i there have been times when i felt like i've had less or more sort of agency over what I think, what I feel and how I behave. And I think that it's, it's sort of something that it's not, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think as a species, we've kind of failed if we let the debate about free will get drawn into a hard binary, a simplistic hard binary. Like I, I do really believe it's, it's something that's, that's sort of possible given the right circumstances but then ha <laughs> ha but then if i just undermine my own argument because then you're a prisoner of circumstance like do you know what i mean it's it it's so hard to even put put words around it um but and then the, the thing about mean like like cables exist because we make them but that doesn't mean they don't exist so in the same way that meaning just because we're sort of create like in one way you can argue that we create meaning that doesn't delegitimize it do you know what i mean and i suppose like there's a religious idea that there's this we're, we're serving this omniscient being right that we're living according to this like the greater power in that way but i i would argue and what the, the buddha's point is more along the lines of in order to function with the sort of, because you could say like life is hopeless, like the the the, the sort of 
existential realities of it are, are dreadful, like the suffering and cruelty and, and all of that of the world, all the bad stuff is there. But that actually to, you can still, despite that, make a relatively good life and that having creating meaning is what almost like it's a protective shell. It sort of guards you and it helps you to grow and it actually helps you to almost be able to thrive and, and overcome, not overcome in one way, but like to... To not just be completely overwhelmed and hopeless. Like there's there's certainly like a spectrum of what's possible in terms of fulfillment and happiness that comes out of having genuine meaning. That that you and, and you can you can ascribe sort of negatively to say, well, it's just all made up and you're gonna die anyway. But <laughs> I um yeah, I think uh I think that was cool. Thank you very much. You got anything else to add? Yeah, just slightly to those last two things. So I'm slightly in the it's all made up and you're going to die camp. Um, but I think I think it's a sort of, not necessarily a confusion, but I, I think that having meaning for why things happen and why you choose to do what you do and a subjective feeling of free will, that's all really helpful. But I think that it's important to recognise that just because it's helpful doesn't mean it's true. Um and I don't believe it's like, oh, everyone has their own truth. And, you know, it's more that everyone is using the tools that they have to create an, a story that's helpful for them to move through through time in a way that's like avoid suffering and maximizes sort of flourishing. Um, the free will side of things, I do come down. I basically sort of intellect, intellectually, I'm pretty determinist and I don't think there's free will, but I've, it's subjectively impossible for me anyway not to feel like there is right like when i take actions i feel like i had some kind of direction over that but i do think i think the important thing with the free will discussion is it's not it's much more beyond you just have to keep going backwards and it's that thing of perhaps it felt like you took a free decision but like you said it's environmental so i i just don't think that given any decision I make or anything I say, if you were to rewind the clock, that I would do any different on the second time round. So it might feel like I have a choice, but I think I would make the same choice a million times in a row because I, you know, you can't choose your parents, you can't choose everything that happened to you, you can't choose your genetic makeup. Like in a strange way, both your, I mean, it's interesting, there is more stuff now saying it's funny that both both, you know, very strong sort of people on the nature nurture front, very strong pros for either side, rather than this more modern blended or more contemporary sort of blended idea of it's a mixture of both. They both fall very hard into determinism that one side thinks you're a blank slate and culture determines everything about you and your, or your experience or your parenting or whatever. And the other side is like, oh, it's nearly all genes and that determines everything about you. But what they're finding is, and it's this thing more of like this sort of, I think they call it your stochastic environment. So it's basically like the chaotic, unique set of circumstances that you experience over your lifetime. Like the different, the, the thing that explains differences between identical twins. Um, so, and what's interesting with that is it introduces this idea of sort of randomness and chaos. So maybe that's a way out with the free will thing. So maybe it's that actually you would have done different things were you to replay it over, but not for the reason that you think, i.e., oh, I chose, not you as in you, but you as in one. Um, I chose to do this. It's more that the quasar that came from space over light years and hit you in the brain at a certain time and switched a synapse. It could have happened the other way or hit a millimeter to the right because of chaos. And potentially if you reran it, it wouldn't hit in quite the same way as possible. I mean, I guess with all the quantum stuff, which obviously I'm not even pretend to understand, but there is an element of it being, it's much less uh deterministic it's much more probabilistic so it's not that things are in certain positions at a very small scale it's that there are probabilities that things are in different orientations at different scales which potentially gives you you know if it's all billiard balls crashing around in very circumscribed paths and any time it happens it will do exactly the same thing every time that kind of closes the door to free will as far as i can see but if it's got this layer of randomness even if it's a very small 
layer of randomness at a very, very micro scale, potentially that comes up the pipe into a more human observable reality. But I mean, I'm nowhere near beginning to understand even the people who are still confused by that. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not really there. Um, I do think, it's, I mean, I do think the project of meaning making and also, yeah, creative practice or or lifestyle design, not in the kind of tech bro San Francisco sense, but just in terms of like, how do you create a life that is both satisfying to you and allows you to process the inevitable suffering that you you have and also move through the world in a way that is both beneficial to yourself and and to the people who surround you. You know, I think that's a valid project. But if you were to question me purely intellectually about it, I don't think necessarily you have much choice about the decisions you're making at the ground floor of that. It just feels like you do, which is why it's an important project to keep doing. Because regardless of whether you have any control or not, subjectively it feels like you do. And as a human, your only point position on reality is a subjective position. So you need to do something that makes you happy in a subjective sense or content in a subjective sense as much as it possible, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's in, it's interesting. I, uh, you've given me a brilliant opportunity to plug my new EP, which is called Nihilism is Pointless. Uh, you can make of that what you will. <laughs> it's available on all good online platforms. <laughs> it's not out yet, actually. It's out this Friday, but obviously I'm not going to share this until a bit later. So um, shout out to Christian and the uh, Faith and Industry crew for supporting me. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a funny one, like the sort of barometer of behavior and like sort of trying to steer away from, from hopelessness and despair and nihilism in, in the sort of context that we find ourselves in. I mean, it's, I, I, for me personally, it's something that I like to play these sort of thought experiments and, and see where you go and just like not feel like you're going to come to any conclusions, but you know the, the the buddhist thing which i i kind of tend to as subscribe to is the idea that um you know life is essentially sangsara or suffering and then the fuel of the suffering is craving the nibbana is the cessation of craving and then there's a, the process which leads you to that point so i think that sort of implies quite an interesting balance between being essentially an, an automaton like having zero agency and just sort of being buffeted by the winds of existence but then there's something about like that sort of mindfulness in the sense of self-awareness of being bound up in cause and effects like the dependent origination like a, a constantly winding wheel of like craving and birth and so on round and round and round in what even just in you could say in one lifetime and then is there you know what is the potential for transcendence in in, in, the, in the buddhist context it's it's very clearly laid out that there's this sort of inextricable relationship between suffering you can't have salvation and and the naroda the cessation and freedom and nibbana blah 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 without suffering they're like bound up together and in the same way that you can't have you know i suppose some people would see nibbana or or enlightenment as sort of the buddhist equivalent of of um monotheistic belief and belief in an all like there's a sort of transcendent the out of the mundane like you can't you can't touch it you can't experience it it's sort of beyond the mundane existence and oh well you're just believing in the god or whatever like oh you're just part of that i know what you're playing sort of game you know but then there is this very much this this idea of the what's called the eightfold path and this idea that actually in order to progress and develop and change and whether you ultimately sign up to the idea of something that is transcendent that is sort of beyond the ken of the normal like beyond mundane normal reality there is something that's beyond that but like it's very much a case of you know the buddha sometimes he was quite esoteric and and quite abstract talking about anatta and void and all this stuff but then on the other hand you know he's very very clear he's categoric that you can't sort of go beyond the sort of mundane life as it is without getting your shit together basically like without getting your house in order without just having like 
good relationships with your family, having a livelihood, not causing harm through your behavior, like just really simple Ten Commandments type stuff. And that the only way to get to transcendence is is through that process. And you could see like an analogy in a way with, um, you know, if you want to progress in any discipline, you know, like you're talking about, if you want to learn a language, if you want to get good at photography, if you want to become a really great athlete, whatever it might be, if you're a mess, you're going to make it a lot harder. <laughs> like there are, there are obviously l like lazy, brilliant people and there's freaks of nature, frankly. And I've heard all sorts of stories, like someone who did their Oxford exams on ketamine and they still got a first, like no denying those people exist, but they are like a fraction of a fraction, like most people that really go on to achieve greatness. And that's obviously a complicated thing to define, but they have to have their bases. You know, they have to have a house to live in. They have to have a good diet. They have to sleep well, like all the basics have to be checked off. And so for me, like, even if in one way you could make a case to say any idea of agency is a sort of delusion. To me, it's like, even if the meaning is self-constructed and I am just an automaton following these like predetermined processes, there's a feeling like I, I have a, I definitely have had a feeling of more or less agency in my experience. And so I suppose we're kind of agreeing. We've just talked in different angles on it because I think what you're saying is you would agree that you would personally feel like there have been times in your life when you've had more or less sense of an agency over your emotions and your feelings and your thoughts and your behaviors. Is that right? Yeah, less. I mean, I, I think I have very little agency over my thoughts. And I think through meditation, that's actually something that I have subjectively experienced, which is like quite how much like thoughts and emotions are totally beyond my control. I can choose how I react to them, or it feels like I can choose how I react to them, but I don't get to choose the base state of those thoughts or emotions. Interesting. Um, but yeah, I do. Yeah, it's exactly that. I think intellectually, you know, I, I think I find it very hard to to see a point at which I could somehow change what's going to happen or what I would do in any given moment based on the fact that everything that's led up to this point was beyond my control. But like it's a, it's a factor of chance or or maybe predestination or whatever. I, I'm not interested in, you know, I can't speak to what's causing it or what mechanisms at work. But at the same time, yeah, subjectively, I almost always feel like I have agency, you know. I mean, why do anything? Why am I... Why did I just start a newsletter? Why am I trying to be a photographer? Why am I trying to get better at various things? But the thing is, regardless of whether it feels like that, that doesn't say anything about the objective nature of what's going on. It's just my subjective feeling that that's what's happening. Because even if it was being controlled, I mean, it just is turtles all the way down. Like even if you start looking at it, it's irrelevant how I feel about it, basically. But from the point of view of like, as someone who subjectively feels like they're in control of what's going on, it still makes sense to try and take actions that maximize my chance of flourishing and also, yeah, being a pleasant person to be around and to leave the world better than I found it and to contribute, basically. Yeah. So, um, well, I think maybe we'll just uh, start to wrap things up. Have you, I got to plug my EP. Have you got anything else that you'd like to plug? You said you started a mailing list, which is really cool. I really enjoyed reading that, the first one you did. And you're going to look at doing your own podcast as well. I mean, just floor is yours. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. So um, I've just launched the Art and Attention newsletter, which um, is weekly for the moment. I may drop it back. If people find that's too many, I might drop it back to every second week. But at the moment, it's weekly coming out on Sundays. Um, you can sign up at buttondown.email forward slash Oliver Holmes. Um, and then also that the first issue talks about proximity, which is a photography project I've been working on during the lockdowns. And while now we're in the third lockdown, I'm probably gonna shoot a bit more for it. The sort of current core edit is up on my website, which is oliverholmes.com. And yeah, so there's a lot, there's lots of photography on my website. There's the newsletter and then I've been doing more on Twitter. So lots of stuff talking about photography, awareness, creative practice, uh, science, reading, all those things that are interesting to me. Um, cool. And that's just at Oliver Holmes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, well, what I'll do as well in the, um, in the info notes underneath the YouTube link, I'll include the links and stuff so people can click. Sounds through great. And... Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.